Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Drupal! <laughs> so um, my name is Owen. Um, I've been working with the local team and the Drupal Association to uh, bring you the first DrupalCon in the Southern Hemisphere and uh, obviously the first one that we held in Australia. And thank you. And when we started thinking about doing this a year ago, we really had the idea of growing Drupal Down Under in mind as the theme for the conference. And it's definitely evidence of all you sitting here that we've achieved that goal. And uh, we definitely couldn't have done it without all the volunteers who've done work on it locally and the uh, essential help from the Drupal Association. And I think we've definitely passed the tipping point of Drupal being a uh, serious consideration for building great websites in this region. And uh, the important thing about this being a DrupalCon, uh, unlike the Drupal camps that we had in Melbourne and Brisbane and in New Zealand over the last few years, is that we've really been able to invite some of the best minds internationally from within the Drupal community to come here and share their insights, experiences, and, and vision for the future around Drupal, as well as giving everyone locally uh, a platform to showcase the great work that they've been doing too. So I'm just going to skip through some quick housekeeping things before we get going. Um, it looks like everyone's comfortable in here and there's a few spare seats if you need them. We do have an overflow room downstairs, um, but it doesn't look like we need that today. In the event that we get asked to leave the venue for any emergency, just make your way across the road to the park next to the beach um, and hopefully we won't have to do that. <laughs> So uh, for those of you that have attended DrupalCons in the past, you'd know that we do a, a group photo. Normally we do that uh, after the first keynote. We're going to swap that to tomorrow morning after Kate Lundy's and uh, try and wear your favourite DrupalCon t-shirt. And uh, we've obviously got some for you if you've uh, turned up this morning and registered. We'll be catering all of the breaks and lunch today. So uh, there'll be coffee and, uh, and lunch served outside the main session rooms. And if you have ordered a special meal, uh, just ask one of the banquet attendants and they'll go and fetch that for you. Now, the only thing that kept us up at night in getting this together was the internet connection. And I do have to thank the Crown Plaza for literally replacing all of their infrastructure to, to cope with us. Uh, so there's new Wi-Fi access points and a fibre connection in here. However, it's been live for tw 24 hours, and uh, if we can lighten the load on it where possible, that would be fantastic. So there's only two things I'd like to request. If you've got a Wi-Fi, a, uh, a wireless device that's got a good 3G or 4G connection, please just stay on that, and uh, obviously don't download any BitTorrent movies or <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> um, now, in terms of actually getting onto the internet, I do have a slide about doing that. And is that coming up? Back one slide. Um, so look for the Drupal Wi-Fi access point and the password is DrupalCon2 to get onto that. And you do just need to go through an authorization screen, uh, select the second option in the middle and put that password in there. Okay, so that's the internet. And uh, when Dries has finished his keynote, we'll have the opportunity to ask him the curliest questions you might have stored up about uh, where he sees Drupal heading. So please just use the hashtag DriesNote on Twitter and Kim will be compiling those questions and we'll uh, just select a few of those. And um, before we get into the, the main proceedings, um, I wanted to introduce Michael West. Michael's representing the uh, La Perouse Local Aboriginal Land Council for us today, and he's going to provide our, our proper welcome to country. So thank you, Michael. Thanks, Owen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. How are you this morning? Looking forward to the next few days? Excellent, excellent. And this um, beautiful land here, we're on the land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people, one of the 29, two of the 29 clans of the Euro Nation. And uh, other clans, it's important that people understand, the onus is on all Australians, to understand, appreciate and learn from the oldest living continuing culture today. We've been on this continent more than 60,000 years and in this area more than 50,000 years. It's important to understand that. There's some great things to learn about community, about um, connectivity, how everything is connected in the scheme of the universe. From me to you, to the person sitting next to you, 
to the beautiful whales that up and go go up and down the coast here, to the particle of dust on the wind, to the drop of rain that falls from heaven. So we're, we're all connected in the scheme of the universe. And also, it's important that we uh, do have a little bit of history here and, and some ideas too, that when you're probably the very first um, road in around the different areas around Australia was probably based on an ancient Aboriginal track. Recently, um, there was a World Indigenous Business Forum here, late um, in October last year. We um, created these message sticks. I've got one here, but not from the World Indigenous Business Forum. It's one that we created recently about diversity. And message sticks traditionally they would be taken to different clans, tribes and nations. They would be a prompt to deliver a message, a consistent message. The person who had it would have diplomatic immunity in a sense. They would be an ambassador and they would be an emissary. This message here today is I've bought, it's about diversity. It's about diversity with age, ethnicity, culture, language, gender, disability, and I've got a small dis there because it's more about the ability of people and GLBTI and customs and religion. It's important that we do, as humanity, we do appreciate what we have in common but also our differences. If we didn't, it would be a very boring world. We'd all be the same. And I look out there and I can see all the different faces from all the different lands from this little planet we call Earth, we share as humanity. And a little bit here is about the undulating lines or wavy lines, whichever way you want to put that, is about the path and journey. Everyone's on a path and journey. It's important that you find out what makes what is best for you, both spiritually, physically, mentally and culturally, what is the best path for you to take. Everyone has their own culture. It's important you understand that and respect that and learn from your family traditions and the traditions of where you come from. The dots represent time and the concentric circles represent places. The places you stay, the places you live. And right here would be a place on that now. And think about it, every one of you here would have a different interpretation of this, being the different places you've, you've been to. It's important to um, learn about each other's culture and that's why we've created these, to, to get people to think. And we recently, well, we gave one to the Business Council of Australia, and that's like the top end of town, as you know. And uh, we m reminded them that for 60,000 years we've been doing business here. Some of them did laugh, but they um, realised that we weren't, we weren't uh, joking, we were telling the truth. There's been trade uh, amongst the clans, the nations, the tribes, up at the top end across the seas and that. And um, if we can make people think and make people understand and learn that there's more than one perspective and one idea in this world and to take our blinkers off in a sense and look around us and, and share our stories, share our, if we share our stories we make that connection and it's a good way of inspiring each other and that's why you'll come here isn't it, you've, you've come here to share your stories of what you're doing in your different areas of work and that, but share more than that and that way we um, understand that we do belong to the one tribe, the one tribe of humanity. You belong to a Drupal tribe, but ultimately you belong to the tribe of humanity. Every way, your family's a tribe, your community's a tribe, your organisation's a tribe. It's important we just have a moment, silence to pay respects to not only the Gadigal and Bidjigal of the beautiful land we're on here today, but all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander traditional owners, elders and custodians of the past, present and future, the timeline, and also the continuum. Also think about our ancestors. We've got to pay respects to them. One day we're going to be returning to Mother Earth and become part of her. When you walk around the land, the spirits are here amongst us right now. And it's important to think and take a moment to reflect your journey, wherever you've come from, around this little planet, this little rock floating through the ever-expanding cosmos that we share as our tribe of humanity. Water is life, isn't it, when you think of us? We're predominantly made up of water. And we can't go without water for very long. It falls from the heavens, it finds its way to the oceans, the river. If you journey north from here, there's a the Hawkesbury. South is the Georges River. East is the Pacific Ocean. 
west just out here um, is the Pacific Ocean, west is in the pen. These are the aquatic boundaries of your own nation. To any of my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters out there, we warmly welcome you from the land, clan, tribe and nation you come from, to all our brothers and sisters, we warmly welcome you from the land, the family, the neighbourhood and the community you come from, to the ancestral land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people, Eora land, Aboriginal land, always was, is and will be. We want you to have a safe stay on this land, we want you to have a safe journey home to your family, your loved ones and community and to make the most of the next few days. Because it is about sharing knowledge it's, and if the more we share, the more we learn from each other, I think the, the better this planet becomes and we share those stories. So whether you've journeyed across rivers, oceans, mountains, deserts, plains, whatever you've journeyed across water or land to be here and it's a journey of you and your family and your bloodlines before you, we welcome you here. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Hi, my name's Arnon. I'm from the uh, Technocrat Agency. Um, we're sponsors of, the, uh, of DrupalCon Sydney. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're very proud to sponsor DrupalCon Sydney. Um, the, um, the, the, it's, it's, and I was going to pay a, a, a note of thanks to um, Owen and his team for their hard work in getting, the, uh, in getting this organised. Um, I know it hasn't been easy. So well done. Um, the uh, we have a stand right out the the, the front. We um, we we're all very friendly. Um, so and we encourage you to come and um, uh, share your stories of UX and um, and Drupal um, and everything in between. The um, the uh, I, I it occurs to me that I um, this is an entire uh, this is superfluous. Um, introduction because um, I think everybody knows who Dries is um, and what he's done and what he's done for the community. The, um, the, uh, if, you, if you don't, I think there's a, um, the, <laughs> I, I think you're in the wrong conference. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the conference for uh, living under a rock for the last five years is, um, is down the road, probably in Melbourne. The, uh, <laughs> It's a bit early for Melbourne bashing. <laughs> it's never too early for Melbourne bashing. <laughs> so um, in instead of introducing Dries to all of you, I thought we'd introduce Dree, well, you've got to pay attention, to a quaint Australian custom um, of uh, nicknaming people uh, who are our friends. And um, yeah. Um, <laughs> So um, generally what, what we do is we truncate somebody's name, shorten it to as um, few syllables as possible and add an O or a Y or sometimes an A to the end of this name. And so Michael would become Mick or Mikko or Mikey, oh yeah. Uh, David would be Dave or Dave-O, Dave-E. Kev would, Kevin would be Kevin. Or, sorry, Kevin would be Kev or Kevo. Um, you can see where this is going. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, I at school, and I stress at school, um, so even the foreign names were uh, 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 get the treatment. I was Arnie. It's awful. I stress at school. Anyway, um, enough of me. Uh, Please may welcome <laughs> um, our, the, our first keynote speaker for DrupalCon Sydney 2013, Dreezy. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be here. Um, it's, it's great to be back. I think last time I was here, which was last year, I think my nickname was Crocodile Drundy with an R. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think this is an improvement. Um, also, really like sort of the um, the other intro. I, I think you know I very much like to believe um, that Drupal is a global project, and as a global project, we are 
represented all over the world. So it, it's great to finally be here in Sydney as well. And, and I think with a global project, there's a lot of cultures, there's a lot of backgrounds, there's a lot of genders and, and all of these things. So diversity is definitely um, important for us. And I like to believe that for the most part, we do pretty well at that, creating diversity compared to others, but it's an area where we can always do better. So I encourage all of you to, um, you know, to, to, to work and to help with that. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the state of Drupal in, in good tradition. Um, I have a lot of slides to go through. Um, so how about we just get started? And then in the end, there's going to be some Q&A as well. So feel free to ask questions on Twitter um, with the hashtag DreesNote. Um, and so, so to kick it off, one of the things I like to do, or what I, what I try to make sort of a central theme of, of my life, um, is, is this notion of doing well and, and doing good at the same time. And, um, and I think it's a big part of Drupal. I also think it's, it's been a big part of Malum and Acre and the Drupal Association. So I really, I really try to, to, make, to make this a, a big deal. And, and I, I think Drupal does really well at this notion of doing well and doing good. And, and what I mean by that is that as, a, as, as members of this community, a lot of us make money you know, doing Drupal, which I think is great and kind of speaks to the doing um, well part. And at the same time, we're also able to do good, meaning we're able to give back to the world in, in one or more ways. And I think that combination of doing well and doing good is really, um, you know, for me at least, it, it's, a, it's a big driving factor of what I do. And, and it's a big part of the vision that I have uh, for the project. And it's not the kind of vision, so we have kind of different visions, I guess, but this is maybe sort of an underlying vision, if you will. It's not one that we talk about a lot, but I do want to talk a little bit about, it, about that today because I do think it matters. And I have some recent examples of, um, of that. And how many people know Superstorm Sandy? All right, so most people do. Um, so Superstorm Sandy was effectively a giant storm, like a category one storm in the United States, uh, October 2012. Um, and it pretty much flooded large parts of New York, as you can see in this picture, or I think this is New Jersey, but you know, again, it's obviously uh, pretty flooded. Um, 253 people were killed, and I think it was the largest um, Atlantic hurricane on record. So it was a very big deal in the United States. Uh, millions and millions of people lost power for, you know, sometimes over a week. Um, metro stations were flooded. Um, you know, pre pretty wild. And one of the cool things that happened is that the um, MTA, which is the uh, Metropolitan Trans Transportation Authority, basically responsible for the metros and the trains and, and the buses, uh, they had just launched a Drupal site, uh, you know, just before this happened. Um, and they instantly became one of the more important sites for people uh, that were affected by the storm because they needed to like, know, know information about how to get from A to B, especially in New York, where people don't have uh, cars. <laughs> and where you know, taking the metro is a very big deal. Um, and, and one of the cool things that happened is that because they were built in Drupal, they were able to update the site remotely because power was out and so that to use their cell phones to give updates to, to the public. And a lot of other sites, or like a lot of other sites were down and this site stayed up. And so, um, it really helped, it really, you know, it's really essential um, for them to, to communicate with each other. And actually, um, you know, I was talking to the CIO of the MTA and, and he said that they went from being criticized for having crappy sites and like, you know, poor service to being really praised uh, around the time of Superstorm Sandy. So, you know, big win for Drupal and an example of how, you know, our technology can scale and can really kind of do well and do good in the world. Another quick example is uh, Stand Up to Cancer. <clears throat> this is actually uh, based out of the uh, UK, and it, it's one of the, probably the biggest fundraising that, that they have around cancer, I think, just last year. They raised more than seven million uh, you know, British pounds in one day. And Drupal was a key part of their ability to raise money. It enabled them to uh, encourage people and, you know, convert people, if you will, to, to go and raise money. So another great example. There's, there's local examples as well, um, like the ALRC. I, I had not heard about it, but 
um, you know, Owen actually told me about this, this website, but it's a great example of how Drupal helps governments uh, change the way they work. And so this, this is an agency within the Australian government. And what they've done is they've changed the process. And they basically build a website that allows citizens and other people to review uh, proposals uh, you know, for national laws, I believe it is. And so they, they went from a process where they used to like, exchange work documents behind a firewall to putting everything on the web using Drupal to encourage people to give feedback. And uh, very often these, these uh, proposed changes by, by the citizens of Australia, they actually do make it into the law. So I think, again, it's a great example of how Drupal can help you know, basically change the way government works and how we enable um, that to happen. Another great example is Al Masri. How many people know Al Masri? Okay, quite, not that many people. Um, so Al Masri is interesting because I mean, it's an amazing story for Drupal, really, and an amazing story for, for the world, in my opinion. So Al-Masri is uh, an independent um, news journal, newspaper in Egypt. And so it's the, only, um, it's the only publication that's not controlled by the government. So all of the other broadcasting channels are all government-controlled. Government and so they have a Drupal site. That's their Drupal site. It's their main website. And through their journalism, through using Drupal, they actually opened the doors for people realizing in Egypt that they didn't need to live under the Egyptian regime. And so through their journalism, they were able to get 100,000 people to, um, you know, to show up in the streets of, of, of Egypt and to really um, revolt, basically, against their government. Um, and so the, uh, you know, if you go, there's articles written about this online, but the, during this revolt, the, the journalists of Al-Masri, they were hiding in their offices and they were, you know, bullets fl flew, through, <laughs> flew through their office space. But, um, you know, people tried to take the site down and all of these things, but they managed to keep the site up. Um, and it actually led to the president of, of Egypt resigning. And so here, here we are, like how Drupal, <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's not Drupal that did this, but we provided them the technology. We helped enable them to, you know, effectively do what, what they did. And so the president resigned. And I'm actually not sure what happened with the regime, but I think it's probably an early sign or a first big step to, to bringing more democracy to Egypt. So but that's kind of a cool, cool thing, right? And then um, We the People. How many people have heard about We the People? Okay, quite a few people. So We the People is, is a subset of, of whitehouse.gov. And it, it's really cool um, because they basically built a platform that allows any American citizen to start a petition. And then the government, President Obama, basically said every, every petition that has more than 25,000 you know, votes, I guess, will, will, off, will provide an official government reply. We'll actually take it serious. Um, and you know, we'll look into what we can we can do about that. Um, and it's really fundamentally changing the way people do, or, or the way government, governments work. Like these things weren't possible only a few years ago, and, and now they're starting to make their way in governments all around the world. I actually, I believe, I was listening to a quick um, presentation of the Lord Mayor of Sydney only two, two days ago, and apparently they have a very similar kind of site here within the, I think the Sydney government, but um, the details kind of es escaped me. Um, so it's a very cool site. And actually one of the cool things that happened is somebody basically created a petition to, to build the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> and like I think in, within 24 hours they got more than 25,000 know, signatures, of, of course. And so the government actually replied, and here's what they said. The construction of the Death Star has been estimated to cost like so many trillion dollars. And I said, <laughs> we're working hard to reduce the deficit, not to expand it. <laughs> and then they also said, the administration does not support blowing up planets. <laughs> and then they, you know, they said something else like, um, why would we build it if it has obvious fundamental flaws? And uh, like one, a one-man starship can destroy it. <laughs> We don't want to build that. So basically, 
thanks to be the people which is built on Drupal, uh, we kind of saved the world. <laughs> Actually, I'd like, I'd like to take that back. We, we saved the universe. <laughs> Um, but I, I guess, like in an indirect way, it comes back to this notion of doing well and, and doing good. Again, we make money building websites with Drupal, and I think that's wonderful. But at the same time, we provide the tools that indirectly enable all of these organizations. And there's literally tens of thousands of nonprofits built on Drupal. We enable them to better fulfill their mission, to go out to their base and to activate them to do whatever the mission is. Of, of that organization, whether it's a government, a nonprofit, um, and so I'm very, very excited about that. Um, the other thing which I think is, is clear from these examples is that it's no longer about just publishing content. Drupal is really getting to the core um, of what these organizations do, and it, Drupal helps them run their, their business, whether their business is doing government, whether their business is raising money or fundraising for nonprofits. It's not just about um, just publishing the content. It's all about like, um, driving people to do more. All right. And so these examples are just a few examples of, of what's going on, but there's many great examples. And, and so I feel like we're on track you know, relative to this mission of doing well and doing good. Um, and I think it's only going to get better. And I think it's going to get better because, you know, with Drupal 8 on the horizon, I think we're going to enable much more of that kind of stuff. And so I want to talk a little bit about Drupal 8. I'll give you a quick update on Drupal 8. And then I want to come back to this and, and, and talk a little, bit, a little bit about where I think we should go next as, as a Drupal project. So uh, Drupal 8, we've been working on it for a long time. It comes back with a lot of great new things. Um, and so I'm going to stay relatively high level. I believe there's a bunch of presentations on Drupal 8 this week as well. So I highly encourage you to check out the schedule and go to the specialized sessions on each of the aspects of Drupal 8. Um, but here we go. One of, one of our biggest things is, is web services and, and mobile in general. And so one of the things we've done is we've added Symfony to Drupal 8 core. And Symfony, for those that don't know, it's an open source uh, PHP-based framework. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we've added it to core. But one of the things it actually enabled us to do is to improve our web services support in Drupal 8. And so if you think about Drupal 8, uh, one of the things that will be much easier is it will be much easier to build integrations with third-party services, whether it's like in this example, Salesforce, but there's obviously you know, many, many other examples. We'll also make it easier to build um, native apps. You know, apps running on Android or iOS. Often they communicate with CMSs in the, in the back end through, you know, XML or, or some other uh, formats. We'll also enable us to integrate front-end frameworks. Um, and finally, we'll also make it easier to do Drupal-to-Drupal -Drupal communication, which, uh, you know, for some, some websites is, is a pretty big deal. So. Very excited about some of the web services things, uh, but also a lot of work on mobile, uh, and specifically mobile uh, browser-based experiences. Uh, and I'll touch upon that a little bit in, in the second sort of big category of changes, but we've made HTML5 the default output. We converted a number of the core teams to be responsive. We've changed a lot of the Drupal administration backends to be responsive, and we're smart about, say, how we render tables, so on small devices, the tables shrink and columns disappear. On bigger screens, more information is, is shown in the tables. Um, we've added a toolbar, which is responsive. So uh, actually, let me show you. Um, well, before we go there, so here are some of the other mobile improvements. As you can see, this is the default theme, uh, Barthic. And it actually uh, it shows it's a responsive design. You can see that based on sort of the navigation, where it says hello and home. Like that used to be next to each other, but on, a, on an iPhone, uh, it will scale down to something like this. Uh, and here's uh, another screenshot of sort of the toolbar where you see some of the icons at the top. And if you haven't looked at, at the toolbar, I encourage you to look at it. But on a big screen, it shows the icons, and then it has a label next to it. But on a small screen, the labels disappear. Uh, and then uh, it also shows the new navigation that we, that we put in, which is uh, all optimized for uh, mobile devices. So 
very exciting. Uh, there's many more improvements, um, but go and check it out. Another big deal in the authoring experience category is what we call in-place editing. I actually don't have a great screenshot of that, but uh, imagine there's like a global toggle to enable and disable in-place editing, and if it's enabled, you can like click on any element of the page, whether it's the author, like uh, shown in the screenshot. You can also click on the, on the body or taxonomy terms, and you can like, there's a quick pop-up dialog that appears and you can make changes uh, in line and, and quickly save things. It's been extremely well received um, in, in users testing. Um, so very excited about that feature. We're adding WYSIWYG to core, um, which RTVC. it's RTVC actually. <laughs> right, we may be adding it today. Um, and that, that's been a big deal because Drupal is pretty much the only content management system in the world that doesn't do WYSIWYG out of the box. <laughs> so we're, we're finally catching up, I think, with the rest of the world, um, um, you know, which, which I think is, is a good thing. We redesigned the content creation page. As you can see, it's now two columns. We have like a clever button, uh, which is shown in blue. But so it has a little, it's like a drop down button. And so you can do um, save and publish, or save um, and not publish, or save as draft. So there's a couple of workflow options in that, but in that button. Uh, it's also responsive, so it kind of degrades nicely on smaller devices and stuff like that. And then there's a lot of other changes, but just at a high level, uh, some of the cool things we, which we've already done. Uh, a lot of improvements for site builders, um, which I think are most of you. Uh, obviously, the configuration management initiative has been committed to core. How many people know what that is? Just to get a quick reading. OK, so about half the people. Um, so let me briefly explain what it is for those that don't know. Um, but one of the challenges with Drupal has been um, the fact that there is no clear separation between content and configuration. And so people, you know, larger sites, but shouldn't be larger sites per se, but people that use um, a staging environment and that push changes to a production env environment versus always working in the production environment, um, they've run into that problem because what happens is the, the, the production environment, people create new content or comments are being added by, you know, visitors of the site. And at the same time, developers are making changes to the development version of the site. And so now you have a site where the database on this site has been changed because of, say, comments and other things which have been, been changed in production. And then developers have made changes, uh, configuration changes um, on the development site. And so now you need to like migrate those changes from one to another. And it's a challenge if everything lives in the same database, <laughs> which is uh, what was the case. And so we've, we've created a separation between configuration and content. And we've also decided that uh, configuration should actually live in files. And so it's stored differently. And the advantage of that is that uh, we can do all sorts of neat things, like we can version configuration. We can check it in in, say, Git or Subversion or whatever your, your tool is. Um, we can make diffs between configurations. We can do rollbacks. So you can go back to an older version of the configuration and things like that. So it will make deployment of Drupal sites easier. Um, and as you can see here, there's a screenshot where we're showing a diff between two configurations. Um, so you can actually see what, what changes have been made. Um, another very big deal is we added views to core. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you probably know, views is you know, the most popular contributed module, really. Um, and so by adding it to core, I think there's a lot of reasons to do so. Like I think it takes some risk out of the release management, it will make adoption of Drupal easier. Um, and it you know, makes it kind of part of, of our best practices, which I think was, uh, was a good idea. And so we've made a lot of changes as we added views to core and um, you know, a lot of credit to people like Jess and Tim Plunkett and Jess is actually here. So I think they'll be talking about views. Is that right? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so anyway, if you have questions, go, go talk to, to Jess. <laughs> but actually, let me, I'll try to summarize it real quick. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we rewrote large parts of views. We, we've kind of adopted sort of, in short, the symphony best practices. So we converted things to PSR0. We leveraged the HTTP kernel in views. We've actually um, updated views to take advantage of the CMI stuff, the configuration management stuff that I just talked about, a lot of other code cleanups. I believe there's a bunch of usability improvements made to views as well. Um, what else? Oh, another cool thing which I'm excited about is we've added uh, RESTful or REST support to view, so you can now create a display that basically exports the view data or, or the view as, as XML. Um, we've made some CSS cleanups, which people I'm sure will, people will like. Um, and one of the, th the things we're still working on and which we could probably use some help with is we're converting actually sort of hard-coded views in Drupal core, like even the main page, the default main page, which just shows 10 notes or something. We're actually making that a view. And so out of the box, uh, these things will be views, making them easy to configure and change. Uh, so that's pretty <coughs> excited. Um, multilingual, uh, we have a dedicated initiative for that. We did a lot of work on sort of cleaning up the base system uh, Gabor has been um, heading up that initiative. We've made a lot of tweaks to the user interface and the workflows. Um, and then we've, we've, we've been integrating um, this deeper into the Drupal system. And so we have been making entities and fields translatable. And we're moving away from having different approaches to how you translate things to having one unified approach. Um, we're also recently, we made better integration with uh, configuration management. And so that was actually one of the big big deals with multilingual that you couldn't always translate configuration. And so we've, we've also streamlined that. And so I mean, this is just a few things of what we've done. Um, I could easily talk for over an hour just about Drupal 8. Um, but uh, there's a lot of great stuff in there. Um, we've accepted almost 5,000 patches by over 1,000 people. So more than a thousand people contributed to Drupal 8 already, and we're not done yet. So um, generally, people are very excited about Drupal 8, um, <laughs> and they usually want it today, especially the mobile stuff seems to resonate really well with people. Uh, and so just want to preempt the questions. When will Drupal 8 be ready? <laughs> um, so I have this little timeline to give you a sort of an update on where we're at. So we released Drupal 7 in the beginning of 2011, we didn't immediately start work on Drupal 8, so that, that took about uh, until March 2011. Um, today we're here, I think that's the correct date. Um, and the code freeze is literally around the corner <laughs> <laughs> and is, is freaking out quite a few people. <laughs> it's, it's literally two, two weeks away, and so this conference is actually a big deal for us as it's a great opportunity to like come together and to get some more new features in and uh, get some last minute feedback. So I encourage all of you to like really leverage the fact that we're all together here, whether you're a developer or not, try to find the right person. If you have a problem somewhere or something you'd like to see changed, it's probably a good time to, you know, to seek out the right person that can help you. Um, and so um, February 18th, there will be the feature freeze. And so what that means that after February 18th, we will be focused on what we kind of refer to as polish, meaning we're going to clean up what's there, whether it's the underlying code, whether it's the APIs, whether it's the user interface, we're going to like polish these things off and make them nice and pretty. <laughs> and then um, the next step will be the code freeze. And once we enter the code freeze phase, which is currently scheduled to start on July 1st, we're gonna you know, switch gears. And we're gonna focus on fixing bugs. And we'll start with the critical bugs with the idea um, that once all the critical bugs are fixed, we can you know, release Drupal 8. And so it's conveniently overlaid with my image. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna go to the next slide. <laughs> Uh, but it actually says the end of 2013, or whenever it's ready. <laughs> but, uh, but that's we hope we hope to get pretty far by the end of this year. Um, and then obviously, often the contributed modules need to be upgraded. But we've added a lot of key contributed modules 
to um, Drupal 8 core, which, which will help. So, and, you know, I really believe that Drupal 8 will get us to the next level. If you look at the other major releases of Drupal, we've kind of doubled with every major release of Drupal, and I have no reason not to believe that wouldn't happen with Drupal 8. Um, the feedback that I get from talking to people is that we have a lot of work to do, especially around polish, but that's why we have the polish face or the feature freeze. Um, but people are excited about the direction that we're going in uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, but even the f despite the fact that Drupal 8 looks very promising, I, I do believe we have a long way to go, especially in the context of this vision of doing well and doing good. I think we can do a lot more of it. And so I want to talk a little bit about our future beyond Drupal 8. And so, you know, today we power about 2% of all the websites in the world, which is, I think, a big number. Um, you know, it's millions of websites. Uh, so one of the questions that people sometimes ask me is, where do we go next? You know, what else is there for us to do? Um, I think it's 10% of the web. <laughs> I think that would be a first good goal. Um, Sometimes people are skeptical about that, but I actually do believe it's, it's possible. Um, and I think it's possible for a number of reasons, like Linux. And these numbers may be slightly outdated, but I think Linux has more than 20% market share. Um, or if you look at Firefox, they have, you know, big market share. So why wouldn't we be able to, you know, become one of these biggest open source projects and do a lot of good uh, in the world? Or what about the largest e-commerce website in the world running on Drupal? Um, that seems like a great goal. It looks probably a little scary for some people or unachievable, but we probably said the same thing about whitehouse.gov only five years ago. You know, what about the largest government website in the world uh, to run on Drupal? Or what about the largest technology website in the world, apple.com? Um, and it, it actually, I looked it up and it's actually the 37th most popular website in the world. I was actually, I was surprised by that personally. I think it would come in lower, but, uh, or what about the largest um, cable news network in the world to run Drupal? And in fact, CNN is already using quite a bit of Drupal, but not for their main website, obviously. Or the biggest newspaper, or the most famous newspaper in the world to switch to Drupal. I think these are great goals to have, and I would personally like to see those things happen. Um, and so the question is, why aren't we there today? What, what's holding us back? Um, and so I think all of these are big sites, and I, I think what big sites need are sort of uh, complete solutions. And I want to explain that a little bit because um, it sounds kind of like a vague term, but um, so, so what does that really mean? What, what are these larger sites actually looking for? And I think it's important that we talk about it because what happens is usually these things start with the large sites and then it trickles down to every site. It's like, you know, it starts at the top and then it becomes more widely available. And so um, the web started sort of with content, right? It was all about sharing content to people. Uh, and then I remember when I started Drupal, um, or you know, released the first version of Drupal, it was, like, was around you know, 99. Uh, one of the big things was we have, um, you know, we have pages and then we added comments to the pages. <laughs> and I was like, wow, um, that was a, it was a very big deal. Like when we made that transition from you know, go, pushing content in one direction to going both directions. And I think that has evolved obviously over the last you know, 15 years or so to be really all about social and community. And then there's also e-commerce uh, as, a, as a very big trend. And I think one of the things that we see in the market is that large organizations need all of these three things. Basically, they need content, they need community, and they need commerce. And traditionally, these have been all separate systems. Uh, and one of the things we're seeing is that they're um, sort of consolidating and that people are looking for platforms that do all of these three things in one system. So you see a lot of the e-commerce um, vendors move um, towards being more of a content management system. And similarly, you see content management systems adding e-commerce functionality. And so I think over the next five years, we'll see all of these things uh, kind of emerge. 
And so why? Well, because we're going we're gonna to go away or we're going away from a world where people just publish content, as I mentioned, to running their business, whether it's selling stuff online, whether it's running the government, whether it's still sharing information. For some people, that's their business. They're in, in the business of sharing information. Or whether it's a, you know, teaching students, educating students. And the web, obviously, is getting at the core of every business around the world. And, and sort of our industry has started to refer to that as web experience management or web engagement management. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I feel um, this is not really criticism, but I feel like a lot of the, the people in the Drupal community, us, were kind of a little disconnected <laughs> from what's happening in the bigger market and the world around us. And we're so into Drupal. Um, but I, I think it's worthwhile to talk a little bit about the trends. And, and so why do people need web experience management? Well, because they want to attract people to their website using great content, using search engine optimiz optimization, they want to engage with these people through great content. They want to influence these people. And ultimately, they want to like, convert them to do something on their website, whether it's to sell something, whether it's to download something, like in our case. Um, there's some sort of transaction, conversion, that people want to see happen on their website. And then they use community to try and retain those people to um, make them come back. Right? And that's how all of these big sites, the, the site that I just put up, Amazon, Apple, uh, all of these sites, that's what they do. It's not just for the big sites, it's also uh, for you know, the smaller sites. It's just that these technologies aren't accessible yet to all of the small sites. But, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But like, even if you look at Drupal.org, our own site, right? we also try to attract people to our site because we want to we wanna engage with them, we want to uh, explain them, we want to influence them about Drupal, we want to drive them to a number of different transactions, actually. We wanna make them download Drupal. If they're developers, you want to make them contribute a patch or add documentation or even attend a conference, right? And then obviously we'd like them to come back. And so um, if you think about Drupal.org, it's again, it's no longer just about publishing content out there. It's really the way we work. It's at the core of what we do. And so that's generally referred to as web experience management. Let's go into a little bit more detail about what that means and, and all of the different pieces to that. But uh, organizations that are getting really good at that, they have a number of tools that they use. So obviously, they've user-generated content. They use a lot of email, emails that are being sent out to users, newsletters, these kinds of things. They use CRM, Customer Relationship Management, which is basically, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of a database of all of your users or customers. Uh, and then you maintain a lot of information about these, these, these people in your database. Are they developers, designers? Are they, you know, their age, their gender? All of the information that you can capture to try and deliver them the best experience on their website. And then they use something which is called marketing automation, which I'm guessing not many people know what it is, but a lot of the big websites, they have marketing automation tools underneath their websites, which will try to learn what people do on the website, and then segment people. Like based on your behavior, they'll say, well, I think this person is a developer, or I think this person is a business, a business owner. Um, and they use that information in combination with a CRM system to really try and drive them to whatever the conversion is that they want to go after. And so let, let's talk about that a little bit to make it more real in context of the Drupal Association, right? Imagine we had these tools, which we don't have today. Um, but right now, the Drupal Association sends a lot of us a newsletter. And it's a very generic newsletter. It's a great newsletter, but it doesn't really target me. It doesn't really target you. It has all kinds of stuff in it. And so what the best organizations uh, are, OK, 10 more minutes. Thank you. Um, the best organizations use all of these tools. And so imagine we had this in the Drupal Association then um, we, could, we could basically, if we, by looking at what people do on our website, we could say, well, this person tends to be spending a lot of time in the issue queue. I bet it's a developer, <laughs> right? Um, or vice versa, this person is trying to look for use cases and trying to learn about Drupal. 
And so if we capture that information through marketing automation and put it in a CRM system and combine that with our newsletter system, we could do very targeted emails. And so we could send developers things like, please attend a code sprint. And that would translate in more developers attending our code sprint. Or um, the business person, we could update that person about use cases. And we could learn what that person specifically has been looking for. Maybe it's scalability. And if a new use case becomes available on scaling on how Drupal can be used for large websites, we could actually push, you know, notify these people about that. And similarly, if we figure out somebody is a designer, we could, um, we could you know, send them, say, tutorials or s send her tutorials about how to theme your website. All right? And so that's what these organizations are doing using email, CRM, and marketing automation. Um, a lot of these websites are multi-channel, and that really means they have mobile versions of their sites, they have apps, but also multi-channel means they integrate with Twitter and Facebook. These are also channels for publishing their content. Personalization, it's kind of what I talked about, but relative to the web. So imagine you're a Drupal developer. If you go to D to do, um, why don't you show me the stuff that I need <laughs> versus um, you know, the stuff that I don't care about. So creating personalized experiences, uh, analytics, obviously to measure what's working, what's not working. SEO matters to these organizations because they want to attract people to the site to begin with. Um, and then um, digital asset management is also an area where you know, people really need, and which we don't really have a strong solution, but that effectively allows them to manage all of their files, videos, PDFs, whatever, um, and then also reuse them across multiple websites. Most large organizations have multiple websites, and so imagine you have a video, you want to show it on a number of different sites. That's what these kinds of systems uh, need. And so all, you know, basically, these big websites, if you want to get to the Apples and the Amazons and that kind of stuff, we need all of these tools, right? And so we need to start thinking bigger because we are still very focused on content management, but not really thinking about all of these different tools. And so if you look at press releases of what these big companies do, they're typically working uh, with large you know, agencies um, using proprietary software, frankly. <laughs> and so what does that mean for us? Uh, well, first of all, I think we, as a community, we need to better be in tune with what's happening in the market. We need to recognize that this is happening. Uh, and then we kind of have to embrace it as well. Um, and so. Um, you know, we need to skate to where the puck will be. You know, we need to build these things or some, somehow get to these things. So if you look at this again, we're doing pretty well in some areas. And so, you know, say with Drupal 8, I think we'll do much better in multi-channel thanks to some of the web services stuff. But um, the other things we can probably get to through better integrations. There's a lot of dedicated systems like MailChimp or email or around CRM. There are some of these systems, some open source, some not, which we can integrate with um, marketing automation systems that we can work with, uh, e-commerce solutions that we can work with. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's probably a good way for us to go. And I think we need to do a better job sometimes at building those integration modules because a lot of these are kind of just working. <laughs> They're just doing one particular use case and they don't always integrate to the level that's necessary for them to be you know, more adoptable. Another thing I would love to see is more startups. And we have a lot of hosting startups, <laughs> but I think we could do with more specialized startups. So I think looking at this graph, maybe an opportunity for all of us to think about what does that mean, right? And so we have a number of great startups. We have Drupal Commerce, Commerce Guys, we have some Uber card stuff around e-commerce, but even in the CRM space, we, we know we have like Red Hen CRM, which is a Drupal-based CRM, and CV CRM, which integrates with Drupal. But look at this graph and think about what other opportunities does this bring to us? Because I, and that's, that's one of the things I'd love to see more because if there's one thing that I'm jealous of relative to say, the Ruby on Rails community, is that they have this entrepreneurial spirit more than we do. And so I, th I think a lot of us are entrepreneurs. We're building, um, a lot of us are building professional services companies that build websites for customers, but few are building product companies. And I think it would be nice to have. Um, all right, a couple of more minutes. Um, 
I think we also need larger agencies. Like these big websites, frankly, they like to work with bigger agencies. Um, and so, you know, I know a lot of people are sensitive to these things. When I, when I say them, it kinds to, uh, you know, make them angry sometimes. <laughs> because, you know, small is beautiful. <laughs> and I agree with that. I really do agree with that. Um, small is beautiful, but, and I really think we need both. We need the bigger agencies and we need the smaller agencies. And um, you need to figure out what you want to be. And so why do we need these big agencies? Because if you think about it, we've actually built most of Drupal through client work. Right now it's the big sites that need web experience management. Um, and so if you had bigger agencies, that would give us a channel to start building out some of these features and functionality, because that's how we've built Drupal to date. Um, and so there's a lot of work to do around the Drupal ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of great companies, but most of them are pretty small still, less than 50 people, less than $10 million in revenue. If you look at the world out there, there is these digital marketing, marketing agencies they're way bigger. They're sometimes a few thousand people and that kind of stuff. And they're really uh, building these solutions. And then we have a separate category of the, the global system integrators. They're giants. <laughs> um, and so another quick way to look at this is these global system integrators, they work with very few companies. They're like the IBMs and the Accentures and the Capgeminis. They're trying to get into Drupal because um, their customers are definitely interested in Drupal. But they need to learn more about Drupal. And so we can help them learn more about Drupal. Same thing with the digital marketing agencies. They need to learn more about Drupal. They're very technically and digitally and business savvy, right? And so they know what they need to build. They can provide this strategic advice to their customers. Like you need when? You need to build this thing to rethink your business. And then there's us, the Drupal shops. And often we're very technically strong, but we don't always provide the kind of strategy to our customers. Um, and so we like a little bit of the scale and the expertise. And when I say expertise, I don't mean Drupal expertise, but like, I mean things like uh, marketing expertise or sometimes it's, you know, expertise in specific, um, what they call verticals. So say media and entertainment or government. Um, and so I'd like to see more Drupal shops that built that kind of expertise. And that's definitely starting to happen in the US. But long story short, I think we need to embrace larger agencies, I think we need to embrace this shift to when, and you know, to wrap it up really, um, I, I think we have a chance to change our industry. I think we have an opportunity to change uh, the industry just like we did with web content management. And so if you look at the history of web content management, um, you know, in the, in the 90s, there was Vignette and Interwove, and these were the big CMS players. And really what happened is, open source solutions like Drupal, we've destroyed them. Like they're still around, but they're pretty much bleeding to death. <laughs> they are. Um, uh, and I think, it, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so in today's world, we see a little bit of the same thing with WEM. So right now, the Adobe's and the Sitecores, they have these solutions. Um, and, I, and so I think we have an opportunity to basically replace those systems as well. We just need to go after it. Um, and you know, I'm, I think it's exciting. And the reason I think it's exciting is because, frankly, they're building closed systems only accessible to a few people that have a lot of money. Uh, and I think we have the opportunity to bring these tools to the masses, just like we did with web content management systems. Uh, and when we do so, we'll be open and uh, we'll be better, just like Drupal is better when competing with web content management system it will be cheaper. But that's not actually the real reason we win. We win because it's better and we'll be faster. You know, we'll be faster to innovate and all of these things. And so I think we can go after that. Why? What's in it for me? Um, I think for the Drupal community, for all of us, I think we get to work on what matters. If we recognize that this is where the world is going, I think we want to do what's relevant and work on what matters. Uh, so we kind of get to build the future of the web. So I think first we need to all believe that this is the future of the web, which I think it is. I think the future of the web is to run your business on the web. Um, for Drupal companies that are interested in this, we get to work on big, bigger projects, which I think should be exciting to some. For Drupal users, again, they'll be able to leverage the web to drive their business. 
and for the world, I think, um, you know, we, we can do more, do well and do good, which I'm very excited about and I hope you guys are as well. So, how can you help? There's a couple of ways you can help. First, help make Drupal 8 our best release ever because it actually will enable better integrations. Um, it will actually enable things like personalization and multi-channel and all of these things. Build more Drupal startups. We could use some more, I think. Um, grow bigger Drupal companies, if that's your ambition. Create better integrations. If we don't have to build everything ourselves, it's okay to integrate with other systems. And you know, can embrace the elephants. You know, embrace the large agencies coming into our world because it actually will help us get there. And so with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you and take a few questions. Thank you, Dries. So we are running a little bit short of time, uh, but we will uh, try and get through a couple of your questions. We've got a, a flood of great questions and we've tried to just compile those into a couple of big themes. Uh, so I'll let you have a, a quick drink, yeah, Dries. But one of the first questions was around uh, the things that you're doing within Drupal 8 that address some of the more enterprise concerns uh, around things like content staging and, and, and those types of issues. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot of these things that we're doing. I think configuration management is definitely one of them around deployability. Um, I, I think the new Symphony work opens the doors for more um, scalability improvements. Um, like eventually you want to get to something which we call uh, edge site include and it's basically a rethink of the page delivery in Drupal which will allow partial caching of elements of a page which will allow us to build bigger websites. Um, I think sort of the entire architecture of Symfony and Drupal built on top of Symfony will be much more pluggable so you can plug in you know bigger, more scalable tools and, and do that kind of stuff. So I, I think Drupal 8 will definitely get us to bigger sites for Great. a number of reasons. And I think one of the other topics that's come up is uh, there's always this slight nervousness when a new version of Drupal comes out. So switching from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Uh, there's a couple of factors in this question. The first one is the emphasis around easing that transition for developers and people on the upgrade path, mm -hmm. uh, and then also the issue around uh, education and right. uh, upskilling within the wider right. developer community for Drupal. Right. Um, well, I'm not sure where to start. It's a very big topic, obviously. Um, on the one hand, we need to train, you know, probably over 100,000 Drupal developers <laughs> on Drupal 8 and Symfony, which is a very daunting task. And one of the things you'll see us do a lot of at Drupal conferences, actually. We need to you know, train them. Uh, hopefully, we'll also be making videos and you know, all of that kind of stuff to get people to really learn about Drupal 8. Um, as always, we don't really try to break people's websites. We try to provide an upgrade path for their data. Um, but it's going to be some work involved if you have custom modules to upgrade, upgrade those. In those cases, we try to help them as well through documentation, we, we also have some tools that attempt like automatic conversions, uh, like the coder module stuff, which I hope will update to Drupal 8 and which will help people upgrade their sites. Uh, to some extent, it's also best practices. I think there's a little bit of learning that people need to do on how to best architect and structure their site to minimize uh, upgrade pains. Like don't hack core <laughs> is sort of the a first line <laughs> of these best practices. Um, so make sure that as you build these websites for your customers or if you build your own Drupal sites internally, um, yeah, make sure to follow these best practices I, that it will actually help you upgrade. And just quickly touching on the uh, perceived skills shortage around Drupal, what, yeah. what types of things should we be considering? Yeah, so uh, that was actually one of the, so one of, I think the single biggest thing that holds back Drupal I, I believe is the lack of Drupal talent. Like wherever I go in the world, that's the one thing people complain the most about. Like I'm, I'm looking for Drupal people. Um, and so I, I think the switch to Symfony is a good one in that regard. 
because it brings more common, like I love Drupal's architecture in, in six and seven, but with the switch to symphony, we move away from some Drupalisms to something which is more commonly understood by non-Drupal developers. And so I think it will actually ease, it will actually make it easier for people to get into Drupal despite, uh, it may be hard for some of you to, to believe, <laughs> Because some of you kind of grew up with Drupal and don't have, say, I mean, that, that's how you got into programming. So that looks like a big jump, and, and, and it is for these people. But I think on the flip side is people that are familiar with other frameworks, I think they'll actually find it easier to get into Drupal. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the switch to Symfony will actually allow us to attract more people more easily. Um, so. Fantastic. So I'm just going to wrap up with one last question. Uh -huh. uh, this is your third visit to Australia yeah. now. Uh, you've obviously seen an audience that was probably the equivalent of that little square over there grow into this. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see next time you've uh, um, come and visit us? Oh, it's a good. It's a little early to tell because it's kind of like day one of the conference. But what I'd like to see, I I don't know yet. I I love it when Drupal conferences get bigger. Frankly, I think it's a good sign. And I'd like it, when they do get bigger, that the audience becomes more diverse. Um, meaning, there's developers, there's designers, there's you know, people looking to start using Drupal. Um, and then there's all sorts of um, Drupal companies involved as well, the smaller ones and the bigger ones. And I, I like it when, I really like, like it when Drupal conferences are a place for all of us to get together regardless of what you do in Drupal or looking to do in Drupal and, and make it a, a really great learning experience for people. And, and the other thing I think why that's important is because so much of Drupal, in my opinion, is built on the relationships that have been created at Drupal cons when, you know, drinking something in a bar or just sort of the after hour activities, if you will. Um, and it, that's really what made us such a strong community. And so I, I really encourage people to have fun at this Drupal conference and to create those relationships because it will actually change the way we all work together. And so that's what I would like to see more of. And that's why I think it's beneficial to, to make those bigger over time. So Fantastic. All right. Well, on that note, um, big round of thank you for Dries. Thank you. And I should just point out that it was actually Dree's original idea that we should turn Drupal Down Under into a DrupalCon in the first place. Um, so if you do have any complaints or general questions about the event uh, during the next two days, um, your email addresses. 